أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ اعتزلتموهم وما يعبدون إلا الله فأو إلى الكهف ينشر لكم ربكم من رحمته ويهيئ لكم من أمركم مرفقا وترى الشمس إذا طلعت تزاور عن كهفهم ذات اليمين وإذا غربت تقرضهم ذات الشمال وهم في فجوة منه ذلك من آيات الله من يهد الله فهو المهتد من يهد الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وتحسبهم أيقاظا وهم رقود ونقلبهم ذات اليمين وذات الشمال وكلبهم باسق ذراعيه بالوصيد لو اطلعت عليهم لوليت منهم فرارا ولملئت منهم رعبا These are the verses inshallah that we're going to focus on today. Umar, go ahead and read the translation. Connect all the way. Oh, I think, can you come here and read for me? He disconnects. Just one sec. It's only here. Try again. Yeah. You can sit on this side. When you have turned away from them and those whom they worship, except Allah, then seek refuge in the cave, and your Lord will extend his mercy for you and provide you ease in your matters. You would see the sun when it rose turning away from their cave towards the right, and when it set, it bypassed them towards the left, and they were lying in the hollow thereof. That is one of the signs of Allah. Whoever, whomsoever Allah guides is the one who gets the right path, and whomsoever he lets go astray, for him you will find no one to help, no one to lead. You would think that they were awake while they were asleep. We turned them on their sides, right and left, and their dog had its four legs stretched, out to the doorstep. If you had a look at them, you would have fled away from them and would have been filled with awe of them. Jazakallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala wa ba'd. Last class, we stopped at the concept of wa'idi i'tazaltumuhum and when you withdraw from them when you isolated yourself from them. And there is a concept in our religion, it, in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's called Al-Uzlah. Which, uh, whoever has the phone, just turn it off. Um, okay, it's a phone there. Uh, so, this concept of Al-Uzlah, which is isolation, or to withdraw, from uh, being part of the life or the public life uh, or to be part of your society, to isolate yourself from them. What's this concept? Where is there is anything in Islam call people to withdraw from the society, to isolate themselves from the society, like this young man did. Al-Uzla, uh, this isolation, first of all, it has two, uh, it manifests itself in two forms, in two ways. Al-Uzla laha ma'nayan. Number one is a tangible meaning, which is literally, physically, you isolate yourself from the society. You go live far away from them. You don't mix with them. You don't deal with them. 
And the other one, it is an intangible one. It's uzlah ma'nawiyya. Which is basically, yes, you may be with, with, with people, with your body, but your heart and your mind and your uh, conscious somewhere else. Uh, you isolate your soul from them. And sometimes, both can be in one situation. Like I give you an example. You might be living in, in a house, or you maybe you've been inviting to a gathering. Okay? But in this gathering, you are sitting with them. But you don't like anything happening in this gathering. So you are completely isolated from this gathering because you're thinking about somewhere else and making stuff far. And you know, I'm forced to be here. But you know what? My heart and mind somewhere else. You know, maybe I work in this place. I, I, I go every day. But you know, I, I am forced into it and my heart and mind somewhere else. So that's what you call al-uzlah al which is an intangible kind of isolation that your mind and heart and soul somewhere else than the place that your body is. You see that these young men, both type of isolations happen to them. In the beginning, they lived with their people who used to worship other than Allah, who used to do all these kind of things that they disagree with, and they disannounce it. They told themselves, we free ourselves from such worshiping. We free ourselves from such practicing. That's right. And they end up with the other type of isolation, other type of uzla, which is they move to the cave away from them. In Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that there is a time will come. يأتي على الناس زمان يكون خير دين المرء The best thing to do for your deen, for your Islam, for your faith is to go to the mountains and to isolate yourself from the society and to stay away from people. And that a day will come. And most of the ulama referring that this is will happen when the fall Messiah appear and Ya'juj wa Ma'juj comes where people run away because they will be either killed or they will be uh, 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 misled by this great trial of the fall Messiah. But it also it could happen at certain time, at certain uh, places. So my question here, what is the guidelines for this concept? Uh, uh, and uh, how can we understand this fully correct? Because part of the isolation is to isolate yourself from the society and the community you're living in. You don't mix with the society that you're in. And I think that's something very well need to be discussed here in America. A lot of Muslim community are also very isolated. Not, they don't mix with the society around them. Uh, where does that come from? What, is the guide, what are the guidelines? There is anything I need to fix? Okay. What are the guidelines in, uh, in, in this issue? As for the isolations, which is physically, you isolate yourself, you don't mix with people, you don't gather with people, that it is correct if the reason for it, it is correct. Like for example, a person will leave certain places, will leave certain people, will leave certain group, or maybe isolate himself from certain people because that those people are considered a threat for him, for his safety, a threat for his religion, a threat for his family, so he will isolate himself from those people. Uh, but he cannot isolate or be doing something haram when they gather. So I isolate myself from this gathering. I don't be, I'm not mixing with them while you're doing the haram. But while they're doing something permissible or something good or something obligatory, I should not isolate myself from them. I should not abstain from them. I should not have uzlah from the society. For example, in Salatul Jumu'ah, in Salatul Jama'ah, yani I know, for example, some people today have this notion. They say, oh, there is so much fitna in the masjid, people gossip in certain masjid. Alhamdulillah, we don't have that in our masjid. But in certain masjids, they people say there is so much fitna, there is this going on. So he stopped going to the masjid. That's not correct. You should look for another masjid. If there is not, you go pray and you leave. You don't leave Salatul Jama'ah because it is from Hadi Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You don't leave Salatul Jumu'ah. Yani last, 
a few months back, uh, last time I, I remember I had a discussion with a brother who stopped going to Jumu'ah. And I said, why? He said, Sheikh, I benefit nothing from the khatib al Jumu'ah. You know, the khutbah is so turned off, is bad, is this. And literally he said, I feel I protect my deen by isolating myself from the people and not even mixing with them in Jumu'ah. He said, that's from the shaitan. This type of isolation is absolutely haram. Some people, when they see the Muslim community have some problems, what they do, they isolate themselves from the Muslim community. And they don't mix with them anymore. This isolation is completely wrong. That's not the uzlah that the sharia said about. At least you don't isolate them, yourself from them when they're doing something correct. Something from the deen like the Eid, the Jama'ah, the Salah, the Jumu'ah, Ijabatu Da'wah, Silatul Rahim, being good to your, your uh, kinship. That's why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he talked about the people who isolate themselves from the society, he said, يَدَعُ النَّاسَ إِلَّا مِنْ خَيْرٍ صحيح مسلم. He said he will isolate himself from the people except from the good thing. And the good things he will mix with people. And also, uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu arda said, مَنْ قَالَ حَيَّ عَلَى الْقِتَالِ تَرَكْنَاهِ وَمَنْ قَالَ حَيَّ عَلَى الصَّلَاهِ أَجَبْنَاهِ in his time in Medina, there was a great fitna in Medina at that time. The Khawarij came and they killed Uthman ibn Affan and there were a huge chaos. But Ibn Umar still goes to the masjid and pray. Even the one who lead the prayer, the majority of the people in the masjid were among them, the, uh, many of them participated in killing Uthman radiallahu So they said, Ibn Umar, how can you go to the masjid and all these People, bad people, they just killed Uthman radiallahu anh. They're the khawarij. How can you go to the masjid? He said, whenever someone said, come to prayer, I go. Whenever someone say, come to fight, I don't go. So he isolated himself from them when it comes to their evil actions. But he did not isolate himself from being part of the jama'ah and the masjid and praying in the salah. Also, it is a permissible for the person to isolate himself from the community for a valid reason. Like for example, someone say, you know what, I don't come to, but not to the obligatory things. Like, hey, I don't come to mix with the community a lot. I don't uh, socialize a lot with people because I want to free myself to seek knowledge. You know what, to uh, uh, pass an exam. Dr. Anas here in this masjid, best example of Uzla. You know what, for the last five months or so, he's with us and not with us. He always sitting in that table, isolating himself from us. Don't mix with us, don't talk to us. Why? Because he's a bar exam to pass in that medical school. He's completely isolated. Even someone told me, what's wrong with this guy? He didn't even yeah, he sit with us. It is for a valid reason because he has an exam, he prepared himself for it. So that's right. You know, to isolate yourself for a right reason, it is permissible. Like fi muhasabat al nafs, you want not to be mixing with people after Isha or after Fajr or because you want to focus on dhikrullah, focus on contemplating in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creation, reviewing yourself, having muhasaba, having islah al qalb, fixing your heart, that's fine. Also, if this is the case, we should know that al-uzla, isolation, not necessarily to be generalized. You can isolate yourself from certain type of people, but not some. The people who waste your time, the people who lead you to do wrongs, not from the people who are good or well lead you to do something right. It is absolutely permissible in a time of chaos, a time of confusion, for the person to isolate himself from the public. And you know what? I don't want to deal with the people. Even he will withdraw from the whole entire society. And will go to his house. Even he can pray at his house. When it's a huge fitna that involves people dying, people's life in danger. In things like of this nature, they are allowed to isolate themselves from the society. If they cannot do any good or change or they feel their contribution will not help in any form or any shape. And that's why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
mentioned in the end of the day, يَكُونُ خَيْرُ مَا لِلْمُسْلِمْ The best, I yeah, think the Muslim can do, is to have some sheep and go to the mountain, uh, uh, taking care of them, run, uh, basically following the rain, and يَفِرُّ بِدِينِهِ مِنَ الْفِتَنِ The point is that he is running away from the fitan, protecting his deen from the fitan. And because of this, I want to say, in some, some countries, there have been fitting a, 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 a great test for the society in these countries. Like in Egypt, what happened in Egypt with the, what he called the Arab Spring, and all those revolutions, and what happened after that. You have in, in, in Libya, you have in Syria, you have in many places, there is a lot of chaos, a lot of problems. So if someone decides to say, you know what, I don't want to pass an opinion. I want to isolate myself completely from this whole thing. I don't want to pass a judgment for or against. I don't want to take sides. I don't want to talk about this issue at all. I want to be completely off. And I will leave the people. I'm not going to have Facebook. I'm not going to have uh, social media. I'm not going to talk about this. I don't want to even be part. I'm closing down all my classes. And I'm shutting down everything. Which is, I know some of my friends did that in Egypt for, ex for example and they decided to be completely silent for a good period of time because they are so confused about the situation is that something permissible absolutely it is permissible and I'm saying this because we have to be also shows mercy and ease on our brothers if they choose that position because that position you cannot criticize them for it but is this the best position? Absolutely. No. Because the Muslim at that time, the community at that time, looking for leader to lead them. But maybe it is the best for him, but not necessarily the best for the whole entire society. But you cannot blame him if he cannot help. If he cannot help and he withdraw from the society, that's the best I can. He should not be blamed. He should not be attacked. He should not be labeled. And, and unfortunately, this has happened in, in many forms sometimes, even in, in some of the local issues. If you don't have anything to say and you basically prefer or, or, or refrain from making or passing any comment in, in the modern issues, nobody can blame you for that. But I will tell you, in time of tests, in time of chaos, People recognize who true leaders and who's not. People recognize who is the person who have the wisdom and the ilm and the thabat, the stood fast during the time of fitna, and who is not. Uh, and we should all remember what the Prophet ﷺ said. الَّذِي يَصْبِرُ النَّاسِ الَّذِي يُخَالِطُ النَّاسِ أو الْمُؤْمِنُ الَّذِي يُخَالِطُ النَّاسِ وَيَصْبِرُ عَلَىٰ أَذَاهُمْ the mu'min who mix with people and he or she is patient with their problems and complaints and you know because when you deal with people you have problems you will be patient with them better than the one who isolate himself from the society and have no patience for people reported by Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala I think isolating ourselves completely from the society is not an advantage for anyone especially for the people of Dawa to isolate yourself from the society completely that will not bring any good to us especially here for America as us as a society and I'll tell you the truth before 9-11 many of our community was very isolated many Muslim community was completely isolated and live in a bubble live in a shell and they don't want to open, open up to any other society. They don't even care about the, others, the, the world around them. They're living for themselves, among themselves, and that's about it. And, and that was not, in many cases, in many community, was the smart move. As a matter of fact, it is important for us as a community to be integrated in the society, 
to deal with other people, mix with other people, especially in the area of goodness, the area that it will bring benefit to us and to the society in large. Um, the mu'min, his or her participation in public life, bring good, bring justice, reduce evil, reduce immorality, reduce uh, uh, injustice. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah give you a very good example. Happened during ibn Taymiyyah time. There is an invader force came and invaded the Muslim world. It's called the Mughal, um, the, Mughal the, the Tatar. They came and they destroyed Baghdad and they basically uh, reached to Syria and they took over all this region. They end up Muslims. But they still, they are Muslims but still monsters. Because يعني, it is very ironic. Not every person became Muslim. He lose what he used to be. You know, you have a Muslim who's still a monster. A, 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 an, an angry person. A Muslim who is a, a miser and stingy. A Muslim who is coward. A Muslim who is, you know, it happened. People are people. So these people, yes, they accepted Islam, but still unfair, the very unjust people. And they did not even, they came up with something called al their own law they apply to the people. Anyway, Shaykh al-Islam, rahimahullah, was asked about a man who will work as a tax collector for them. Tax collector. And we know that those people have put unfair taxes on people. He worked with them, with the government of that uh, invading society, invading force. He was asked, would it be okay? He said, yes, it would be okay if your work with them will reduce the injustice and promote justice. If you can work with them and you will be able to reduce through your work with them the amount of just injustice that happened to the society, work. That mixing with the, with the Tatar, not isolating the self from them, if it will lead to a great benefit for the society in large, go ahead and for go ahead for it. I wish that this example is something that we can reflect upon in our society today. That to open the door for so many areas that us as a community, our presence, our participation in it, in my opinion, will bring a lot of good to the society, a lot of good to the world. Because we are ummah marhuma, ummah that Allah have brought mercy through it. That ummah Allah blessed it. It's ummah that Allah have chosen. Ummah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given a leadership position in the world. Isolation make you suspicious. Isolation make you receptive to all kind of labeling because nobody knows who you are isolation make you very easy target for the media for the public to what to put you in the frame that they like isolation will prevent you from building ties and bonds and and bridges and relationships can protect you in the future you know, we have a simple rule. Everybody, I think, agree on that rule. That you have, you have to make your friends before you need them. That's right. You have to make your friends before you need them. Can you imagine you, if there is a crisis happen? The Muslim community cannot seek friends and help from people. If they never invest in this relationship, if they've never been known, if they've never been basically uh, uh, mixing and, and uh, uh, being part of the society and that's why I do believe that isolation it's not a very good choice for the Muslim community today so for example those who don't care for elections being part of the electing process and they don't go vote what happened this isolation this abandoning it this basically withdraw from it wouldn't help the Muslim community as a matter of fact, most of the thing that you see today in the election cycle that we are in in these days, that's why there's a lot of attack on Muslim in this election cycle. It is because Muslims vote is not very important. It means nothing. You know, not only the numbers, even the money. 
one of the brothers here in our community invited, I don't know if I should go like that clear, invited one of the uh, people who were running for public office in Houston. And he was running for a big public office in Houston. Okay? And he gathered the Muslim community in his house so they can donate. Because vote and, and campaign need money. And that's what makes the society strong. One of the people who came, and one of the, and you can imagine, if I invite people to my house to support a candidate, I will invite the people that, hey, you know, they are wealthy, that's right. He's not, that's why I wasn't invited. <laughs> okay? You know, but he invited the people who have money. One of them brought a check of $23. At $23 for someone running for the highest office in the city of Houston. Then after that we say we demand the Muslim community. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in Islam, in Islam, if you want how Islamic system works, in Islam, your rights is given to you without you demanding it. That's Allah's law. That your rights comes to you even if you don't ask for it. But in man-made law and sharia, it doesn't work this way. You have to earn your right. You have to work your heart to earn justice. You have to work hard to earn your respect. That's how human's law is. It's not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way he put the law. And that's a huge difference between the, the, the way of the Sharia works and the way man-made law works. You know, in order for you to have justice for all, people died. People, you know, uh, uh, humiliated. You see how the black community had to go through much suffering to get their rights. Woman has to go through a lot of suffering to get the rights. And they still didn't get everything else, every, all the rights yet. At least the basic things, like equal pay and, and things of that nature. So you see a lot of things that you have to struggle for. That's the nature of, of the work here. So isolation, in my opinion, for the Muslim community, withdraw from it, it will not help. Withdraw from being part of the economy, an effective partner in building a strong economy. The language of money is the strongest language ever. Being part of every sector, every institution in the government, in my opinion, in the long run, it is a secure few. That's how, in my opinion, one of the ways to secure your future as a community. We need more Muslims to be seen as judge, Congress, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the law enforcement, in the forces, in, in every area in life. You know, it is important to be part of that, of life. And isolation and withdrawal, if it can be applied to one individual who cannot be part of that. Like that day, one brother asked me, okay, that he want to join, for example, the uh, law enforcement. And I told him, I think we will be very good. He's a good Muslim person of a good personality. You will be a good person to go to that field. Or someone want to go to the political uh, field. And some other, I might advise them not. They are very weak. They will not be able to handle all this pressure. And maybe they will be lost and they lose their way. Their family cannot take that. So it depends. So I understand someone can withdraw. But as a community in large, no. We should be seen in every aspect, in every area. It is important to identify yourself before someone else identify you. <laughs> yeah. It, if this been said, I have also to make sure that it's not my ever uh, goal is to see the Muslim community assume uh, uh, basically assimilate the, the other community and we lose our identity assimilation assimilation is not what my goal is integration is my goal is to be part of the society 
but you keep your identity. You keep who you are, the beautiful things that made you and distinguish you. My point is not, you know what, let's drop everything and we just be, have no uh, identity as Muslim. That's not uh, uh, right. Isolation can be even inside one society. Yani you will see in one society, in one community, inside the, the community, sometimes you see part of them isolate from the rest. And I think one of the things that made us isolated from the rest of the community, language, the barrier of language, make you withdraw. To culture, have a different culture, make you withdraw from the society. One of the things is uh, that to make you withdraw from the society, in my opinion, is clothes, the way you dress sometimes. Uh, a lot of people basically, uh, you feel you cannot be mixed because just the way they, they dress, they, they insist on certain type of dress as if it is something uh, 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 Islamic. And I mean by that, in Islam, we don't have so-called uh, Islamic uh, dress, uh, a specific clothes that is called Islamic. We have conditions, have code for things to make it and Islamic. Yes, you can wear culture clothes, like me wearing today, Dr. Shvat wearing today. That's fine, no problem. But it doesn't mean that he needs to go tomorrow to his clinic in that culture clothes. That doesn't mean that. Okay? Because if you insist on that, that can create a problem to be part of the site. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah once said that it is much better to wear clothes that it is similar to the, the common clothes in a non-Muslim land so they can accept from you. They don't isolate you. They don't feel, you feel like a stranger. One of the mashayikh went to Europe. One of the scholars went to Europe. And he was wearing suit. And he's a sheikh, a student of knowledge, was wearing suit. So someone sent him a question. He said, Ya Shaykh, halla akhbartana an libasi Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone sent him a, a piece of paper. He said, can you tell us how the Prophet ﷺ used to dress? I never saw him so before. Okay? And I consider him one of my yani shiuch as well. So he under, understood immediately what? The point, then he said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه يلبس لباس أبي جهل. He said the Prophet صلى الله عليه used to dress the same clothes that Abu Jahl used to wear. <laughs> you got it? He said the Prophet used to wear the same clothes Abu Jahl used to wear. <laughs> the same clothes. Yani. In another word, the guy was telling, oh, you're wearing the clothes of the kuffar. Like the prophet was wearing the clothes of the kuffar too. You know, so he was very smart in the way, and immediately he answered him like this. And this is very uh, true. Uh, one of the areas that I think also Muslim community should focus on and work more on it, that it is participation with other religious community, especially in states and places where faith community uh, very effective. Like, you know, when you come here to Texas, for example, and so many other states as well, in America, generally speaking, religious-based community are very effective in the society. Uh, this issue of when do you withdraw and when you interact and which area you should be part of and which area you should avoid. This area needs knowledge, needs wisdom, needs sabr, needs tawasi. And that's last one is so important. What's tawasi? Tawasi is working collectively, advising one another, watching one another, getting each other uh, each other's back. So if I see Umar, you know, getting a little bit off the, the why, said Umar, hey, you need to watch out. You need to do this. You see Sheikh Walid getting too much in this area. Hey, you need to turn on the tone a little bit. It needs that. That collective work. Hey, I think this area is completely nobody covering it. 
Why don't you do it? Why don't you be part of it? Why don't you represent us in this area? So that's how it is. These conditions, in my opinion, is very, very essential for those who want to mix. I will say them again. Knowledge, wisdom, sabr, patience, and having people to help you work collectively with tawasi, reminding one another. And if I would add anything, it will be confidence. That you need confidence in order for you to be able to mix with people and to be an influence of good rather than just being influenced by people. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that telling us, وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ تَزَاوَرُ عَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ And you might have seen the sun. You, who is you? Who's the Qur'an addressing? It could be the Prophet Muhammad. يعني أنت يا محمد لو رأيتهم Or it could be أنت أيها القارئ للقرآن You, the one who's reciting the Qur'an. The reciter of the Qur'an. So me and you basically. It, um, and you might have seen the sun when it roused declining to the right from their cave. تَزَاوَرُ عَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ التزاور in Arabic language declining or, or uh, declining away declining to the right uh, moving toward the right and there is another قِرَاءَةَ تَزَّاوَرُ عَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ and in the night وَإِذَا غَرَبْ when it comes to the end of the day تَقْرِضُهُمْ القرض يعني القطع okay القرض القطع that's why we say the nail cutter we call it مِقْرَاد why? because it cut the nails so تَقْرِضُهُمْ it cut it means cut off or it will uh, turning away from them to the left. Uh, some of the ulama said, if you notice, turning away from the cave, okay, to the left, and when it rouse, it rouse turning toward the right from the cave. Al Quran referring to the cave, the movement in the, of the sun, and its relationship with the cave. He did not say from their bodies. Like it's not like going away f the right side of their body or the left side of their bodies. It is their cave. And ulama said because the sun actually did not touch their body directly. The sun all, all, only, the heat and the light of come to the cave but did not go straight to their bodies. Did not touch their bodies. Did not lay the, right, the, right, the rays of the sun did not lay on their bodies. Why? Can you think of a reason? Lish قَالْ عَنْ كَهْفِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ مش عَنْ أَجْسَادِهِ Why the sun, the moon and the sun is always connected to the, uh, here in the verse he said, to the cave, not to their body. It's right or left. They said because if the sun basically directed to their body with all this time, it could affect their skin. Okay, so it's not maybe something good for them. But also, if the sun ex basically lay directly to their body, it will expose them. And they want to be hidden from people. Even if someone pass away, will not know that there is someone inside. So the sun only comes into the cave for a little bit in the early of the day. Okay, so there is heat, there is fresh air, so it will be a place that is uh, uh, not uh, netil, yani it will not be uh, like a, a, a grave that it's completely locked. There's no fresh air and circulation of the air. The, 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 the sun will basically uh, uh, assure that this place, the, regularity, uh, the sun regularly come in at angel that prevent molds, insects, um, infestations, uh, things of that nature. So that's the, the, the benefit of having the sun moving like this. طيب. Then, I'm not going to go into this a lot, but some of the ulama said, if when it rouse, 
that al yameen it goes to the right and when it's sunset go to the left so it, that means that the cave opened towards the north and al alusi said northeast in order for the sun when it rises to go to the right and when it goes in the west when it's sunset go to the left so that means it's the uh, the cave opening it was towards northeast and ibn, ibn hazm said just north anyway allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best wahum fi fajwatin min and basically and they lay in the midst of the cave way inside in the midst of the cave so nobody can see them and this is very interesting he uh, he basically put them away uh, uh, from people to be to, to notice them وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِّنْ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ That is one of the ayat, the proof, the evidence, the sign of Allah. He whom Allah guides, he is the rightly guided. But he whom he sends astray, for him you will find no guiding friend, wali or a supporter to lead him to the right path. Then tajida lahu waliyan murshida. It is one of Allah's signs. Referring to what? Mother, what do you think? Ishiya li min ayatillah. Dalika min ayatillah. What is dalika? What's that pronoun leading to? It is that one of. That what? Referring to what? The people of the cave? What do you mean the people of the cave? Oh, very good. He's saying, uh, Sayyidina Nabil, saying that one of the ayatullah, one of the signs of Allah, that he guided such young people to Islam, even though all the elders, all the leaders of their society are misguided that's in itself ayah that's in itself sign that's in itself something miracle that's in itself something unique that's from ayatullah that he guided them even though they are young no experience even though they are going against the rome the culture what the leader says even with all the threat and the pressure they still accept and hold to the iman Another opinion, yes? Preserving their body all these years, all these years, okay? And without changing happening to them, that's one of the signs of Allah. Very good. And that's also that, uh, one of the meaning. Also another meaning, al ulama said, it is one of ayatullah, that Allah guided them to find the cave and to sleep in the middle of the cave in a such way it's amazing how Allah protecting them over there that he never he did not let anyone to discover them all these years hundreds of years nobody discovered them that's one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sign we've been repeating a rule in tafsir many times now we said any multiple opinions been given by the scholars to explain a verse they don't contradict one another we should what combine them all together so we said this refer to all these three areas all this from ayatullah all this from the sign of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and mufassirin the interpreter of the quran go on details on how many of them what's their names where their where's the cave most of the people say that the cave in Turkey today and until today they have a place in Turkey and they have it designated and people go visit it and stuff like that. But there is no proof for that at all. Okay? Uh, they talked about the dog. What color, what kind, what breed of a dog it is. You know? And all these details, there is no proof from it from the Quran and Sunnah. But there is a lot of talk like this. Allah did not tell us where it is. 
uh, how, what's the name of them, how many of them. We don't know anything about these details because Al Quran is not interested in documenting history for the sake of history of the sixth story. The Quran is a book of guidance. Okay, and that's the main reason for it. Tayyib. Ya Salam. If you're amazed by how these young people became Muslims, and Allah guided them versus older people, remember, always try to think about the story and the Prophet time when they received. So the same thing. How come the Prophet most of the people became Muslims in the time of the Prophet were young men, like the people of the cave, not the leaders of the Quraysh, of their people. There's a lot of similarity in the story. Okay? So here, Allah say, not necessarily the smartest, the brightest one, did not become Muslim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want to make a very interesting fact here. That whoever Allah guide, he is the guided one. So the guidance come from me who? From Allah. That's why when the kuffar told Nuh, وَمَا نَرَ اتَّبَعَكَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَرَاذِلُنَا بَعْدِيَ الرَّأْيِ We see the people who follow you are not the brightest among us. Not the smartest one. Why always the, the people who بَعْدِيَ الرَّأْيِ يعني their, their opinion, they're not smart, they're not very good talker, they're not the, the leader of the society. That's why when uh, Abu Sufyan, the king of uh, Rome, asked him, who is most of Muhammad's followers? He said, the weak and the poor. He said, and that's how all the prophets used to, to be. Most of the prophets and all the prophets, their followers were the weak and the poor. Not necessarily the richest, the smartest. The, no, Allah want to make this clear to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam Because earlier, Al-Quran told us how the Prophet want to kill himself over the people of Mecca not accepting Islam. You're killing yourself over their kufr. So here in the verse, want to tell Muhammad وسلم, uh, remind him and everyone there is a very important fact which is whoever Allah guide is the guided one. So those young people, don't be surprised. Allah guided them. And they are the truly guided one. Because guidance are not majored by anything else other than being committed to the truth. Not by your wealth, not by your tribe, not by your lineage, not by the level of your education, not by the, the culture, not by the skin color, not by the, what most of people believe in. No, the guidance is to submit yourself to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why the guidance, because it is from Allah, it is a gift from Allah. It's a favor from Allah. And that's let us as a Muslim today. If we know that, that make us always asking Allah to guide us. Because if you seek guidance from other than Allah, Allah telling you, if you seek someone to guide you through the hard time, through the calamity, through the fitan, through the test, other than Allah, you will never find someone to guide you. To support you. That's why you always attach your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So many times when you plan, you know, I, I attend sometimes these meetings about or conversation about how we're going to counter the message of, you know, uh, the Islamophobe and how we're going to do this and do that. You know, when we forget about one thing that is so important, which is why we planning all this, we make sure that Allah, we ask Allah to guide us to do the right thing. We make sure that we have the taqwa and the sabr and the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will help us to succeed. Absolutely. Because al-hidayah from Allah to open your heart. Because you might find the reason. You might know the way. You might know the road. But the point here is not knowing. The point is willing. The point is that you commit to it. You know it's haram, but you're still doing it. 
You know it's the wrong thing, but you're still doing it. You know, I know all this. But I remember one of the guys here in, in our community, I went to collect from him the um, child support from his wife, for, her, for his wife. I remember Arafat sent me. First year I came to uh, America. My first year, you know, he used to let me run around. I know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so he asked me to help and to get, collect this money for that sister. So first experience, for, can you imagine I'm fresh of the boat, as we say, <laughs> okay? So I go to this guy, and he has a bar. Serve alcohol. So he said, I get you uh, uh, something to drink. I said, no, thank you. <laughs> said, don't worry, halal, water. Said, no, thank you, I don't want anything. Then he said, where are you from? Oh, from Egypt. Oh, my partner is Arab too. He said, is like you. And me and him going straight to hell. Wallahi, that's what he told me. Me and him, we going straight to hell. Wallahi, when he said that, I got a goosebump. We don't pray, Sheikh, and we sell alcohol, we drink alcohol, you know, and we have all bad things we do. He know it's not a lack, not lack of knowledge, but it is the hidayah from Allah. It's the guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He open your heart and giving you the determination to do it. That's fadl. You know what? It's fair, fairness comes to show you the right and the wrong. Fairness is to give you access to knowledge. But it is absolutely a favor is to help you and to aid you. That's why Al-Hidayah is an absolute favor from Allah. And Al-Ghiwayah, going astray, it's absolute justice. Because Allah give you absolutely an equal opportunity. Give you, the, give you the knowledge, give you the sign, show you the two ways, and He left you for yourself. But the other one who Allah guided, He showed him the way, He left him for self, but also He favored him. He gave him the support. He gave him the, the determination. He opened his heart. So you might ask, why would Allah open the heart of this one and favor this one over that one? Because that one show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I need you, Ya Rabb. I love you, Ya Rabb. The other one, his arrogance said, I don't care for you, Ya Rabb. I can't do it on my own. So Allah leave him for his himself. And I'll tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, son of Adam, you walk to me, I run to you. You never find someone walk to Allah and Allah walk away from him. It's not exist. That's why it is al-hidayah. It is two kinds. Al-hidayah is Allah, open your heart. Or al hidayah that Allah show you the way. Showing you the way, it's all humans are equal. But opening the heart, that's a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gives it to you. And Allah said, Len lahu mursida. The one who choose to be in his own and he doesn't care for Allah, you would never find someone to support him. You would never find support. That let you realize one interesting fact about the story. That the elders and the leaders of this village and whoever similar to them, all their positions, all their wealth, all their weapons, all their armies will not support them in the dunya or in the akhirah. It will not benefit them. And that's in itself an indication of giving a glad tidings to the Muslims that they will be the victorious in the end of the day. And the people of the, of the Kahf, they were the victorious. They lived and they passed and everybody else vanished from the face of the earth. That's amazing way of putting it. And also give the same indication to Muhammad Sallallahu with his own people. That Ya Muhammad, don't worry. Nobody going to support me. In the end of the day, they will be the losers. And you will prevail. Also, this verse shows you that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed. And whatever He wills, happens. It's not like some sects in Islam that call it Mu'tazila. They said that Allah doesn't will anything. Allah have no will. People do their own things according to their own will and Allah has nothing to do with it. Allah never willed it, never aware of it. They, they deny the will of Allah. Ankaru qudrat Allah wa mashi'atah. That's why when Arabi, uh, uh, a Bedouin came to Al-Basra. In Al-Basra there is a very famous Zahid, avid, ascetic, worshipper. His, but he is the head of the Mu'tazila from this deviant sect. His name is Amr ibn Ubaid. So this Arabi, show, so he saw his ibadah and he heard about how ascetic is. So let me ask him. He said, Ya Shaykh, ud'u Allah li, pray for me. He said, what happened? He said, I came to your city with my donkey and somebody stole my donkey. Pray to Allah that Allah give me my donkey back. So Amr ibn Ubaid said, Allahumma ya Rabb, inna himaratahu suriqat wa anta lam turid dhalik. He said, ya Rabb, his donkey was stolen from him and you never willed that. You didn't will that. Okay? So bring it back to him. Then the Bedouin, with the fitrah, subhanAllah, he said, Uskut ma akhbatha du'a'ak. He said, Shara, what an evil du'a you just made it. He said, I'm afraid that that God that you pray for, who my donkey was stolen, without his will, and somebody overpowered God's will, and he stole my donkey, if he won't, to return it back to me, he couldn't because he has no will. If this is the case, if Allah God has no will at all, and now he wants to return back my donkey, he couldn't because he has no will. He has no power to do anything in the world. He said, I don't want your, your dua. Get out of here. قَالَ أَخْشَى أَنَّهُ يُرِيدُ رَدَّهَا فَلَا تَقَعْ لِأَنَّهُ لَا يَقْعُ مَا يُرِيدُ That's why Allah said, وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا Allah. Everything you will, it's already willed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you were able to do it. Uh, yani, I just want to end with, with one point. It is so interesting that he said in the beginning of the verse, ذَلِكَ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ It is from Allah's sign. Allah has so many signs, have so many evidence. Some of them we see it with our own eyes. Some of them we hear, we, we hear about them, like this story. But other things that we see, can you give me an example of something that we see from Allah's evidence in the universe or in the world? Like the creation of the heavens and the earth and the sun and the moon, the stars, the way he created all these signs. al ulama said, there is a beautiful meaning here that Allah connect between the concept of hidayah, guidance, and the concept of noticing Allah's signs and evidence in the world. Al hidayah happen, the guidance happen when you look at this evidence in the world. When you look around you and whatever around you remind you of Allah, that's one of the reasons for you to be guided. That you contemplate, you look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at the sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's giving you every day. That you pass by it every day, you live it every day, you experience every day, you hear about it in the Quran, you hear about it in the Sunnah of the Prophet. All these are evidence and signs from Allah. Watching it, noticing it, lead to the hidayah. That's why Allah have put these two together. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses he connect by the, between the two. Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa akhtilafi al-layli wa al-nahar wa al-fulki al-lati tajri fi al-bahri bima yanfa'un nas 
وما أنزل الله من السماء من ماء فأحيا به الأرض بعد موتها وبث فيها من كل دابة وتصريف الرياح والسحاب المسخر بين السماء والأرض لآيات لقوم يعقلون. Indeed, in the creations of the heavens and earth, and the alteration of the light and the day, and the great uh, ships which sail through the sea with that which benefits people, and what Allah has sent down from the heavens of rain, giving life thereby to the earth after its liveliness and disappearing there in every kind of moving creation and his decreeing uh, of the wind and clouds controlled between the heavens and the earth are signs for people who use reason aql thinking and connecting things together so they can arrive to the concept of the hidayah and unfortunately, I did not finish what I was planning to do. But um, we'll try to make it uh, much faster, inshallah, uh, next time.